This third Sunday of Advent marks the converging of stories. The first Sunday we were reminded of a promise Isaiah made a long time ago, and we hear how that promise is reflected in music and words. With the prophet Joel, we join the returning Israelites from exile as they gathered in worship. We've spoken about waiting in hope, longing in love, and today our focus is the expectation of joy. The season of Advent is the bringing together of these strands and how we experience the promises of God. The scripture from Isaiah today points to the promise of restoration with special attention to whom and through whom tangible healing, repair, and hope will come. God doesn't just warn and continue to have people deal with the consequences. God brings comfort and joy. In that time long ago, the voice that once spoke words of judgment, now in their return to Israel, speaks words of joy. Isaiah's voice, which had first afflicted them when they were selfishly comfortable, had become a source of comfort now in their affliction. Because they were pretty much all afflicted now, a nation of people trying to rebuild their lives, just barely holding on. And for the first time in national memory, a prophet brings good news for the poor, was bringing good news to everybody, and specifically those who had had it the hardest. God comforts us, brings joy, calls us to rebuilding, and lifting up what was down. In the Bible, justice leads to wrongs being made right, to restoration, being made whole, and reconciliation. God declares a year of amnesty for the prisoners and the captives. He's bringing about a day of rescue for the poor, the brokenhearted, and all who mourn. In times past, God's people had forgotten about this promise of the Lord's favor or jubilee. It was a year of forgiveness, a year of homecoming, a year of joy. The residents of Israel and the land itself were given a year to rest, but God promised that the land would joyfully yield enough for everyone. Slaves and prisoners were set free, all deaths were forgiven, and all the land was returned to the families who had originally settled it. It was the year of God's vindication, when he settled all accounts and made everything right again. My God had not forgotten this intention, and now God has announced a jubilee for the remnant. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities. Isaiah says, with, people, with God's people resettled in their land and restored to their work among the nations, there was much to rejoice over. God was working to set the world right again by making all the peoples of the earth his people. God will make a straight path for them. God will pour out on them and us an oil of joy in place of mourning. Joy for our journey. C.S. Lewis once said that joy emphasizes our pilgrim status. It always reminds and beckons and awakens desire. That makes sense because joy isn't just a feeling or an emotion. No, joy is movement. It has motion. Within joy is a reaching out, a running toward, a leaning into. Holding on to joy means that we don't resign ourselves to the present reality. Joy means that we trust that there's something better beyond that's happening beyond what's happening right now. And that waiting, that longing for something better, truer, more beautiful, is what gives us that resilience to keep on going. That mindset, it changes the plane on which we live and move and be. Isaiah was imparting joy by reminding them that they were on a journey, a journey that wasn't over yet. He pointed them towards the Exodus and the Jubilee year, joyful events from their past that they could recall and understand that that was going to remind them that God is a rescuing, reconciling, restoring God. And then Isaiah goes further and says, that's actually what's happening right now. God is calling you back home. Just as the prophet Isaiah pointed towards the Jubilee to inspire joy in the remnant, in the present, and the hope for their future, during this season of Advent, the church does a similar thing. 
and more powerful. In a sense, Advent is a time when we are time travelers, hearing these ancient stories, knowing them in the context of a much greater story. When John the Baptist announced in the wilderness east of Jerusalem that there was one who was more powerful that was coming, he was trying to get the people to prepare. And in that coming, John called them to repent, to change their minds, to change their ways to do justice. We must confess our sins and receive baptism of repentance. Why? Because he is coming. But even as John told them to get ready for the Messiah's coming, they didn't quite realize that the Messiah was already there. He'd been in their midst for 30 years, living up in Nazareth with Mary and Joseph. The Savior whose coming was announced by John was already in the neighborhood. Maybe they didn't see him because he looked so ordinary, so human, so there with them. He is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, then, now, and forever which is probably why Jesus, when he first read the scriptures in the synagogue in his hometown, read this passage from Isaiah. Because we remember that the Messiah of Israel, God's anointed one, Jesus came into the world to bring joy. That he preached good news to the poor, that he gave sight to the blind. When he met people who were oppressed by disease or demons or shame or sin, he set them free. And he left behind a people, followers, a church, to be a kingdom of priests to bless all the families of the earth. Our priestly work is to continue what God began in his son, Jesus Christ. The story of Advent is a story about the length and the depths that God goes to restore God's image in us and to heal creation by establishing God's intended reign from unexpected places and persons. That joy sustains our work in spite of all of the circumstances because we know that Jesus has come and will come again. And when he comes again, all creation will be set free in a jubilee. It can be and is hard sometimes, maybe right now, to retain that focus in our everyday life. Consider this story. We bet that something similar has happened to you. You're doing some paperwork or something and it requires your focus. And then the phone rings and you stop to answer it. After a brief conversation, in which you perhaps had to get up and move around or maybe even left the room, you turn back down to sit down at your desk to what you were doing before the interruption. And that's when you realize somehow you've misplaced something. Okay, it's never happened to you really. It has for both of us. Mark couldn't find his glasses or that moment when neither of us can find our phone or our keys. No problem, you think. You retrace your steps, look all around the room, no glasses. So you look on the desk and under the desk glasses. It's at this moment as you start to get really frustrated with yourself that you catch a reflection of yourself in the mirror and you realize that your glasses were on top of your head. Or whatever you were looking for was right there. You'd spent minutes, 10 minutes, maybe longer, looking for something that you already had. Have you ever had that experience? Sure. Well, that didn't make a connection, try this illustration. A person comes into town for a conference and agrees to meet a good friend in a nearby hotel lobby at six o'clock. Now, this was a number of years ago as the story is told before cell phones. Six o'clock, they go to the lobby and they start to look around, look intently, looking for that first glimpse of their friend. At 6.30, their anticipation begins to change to a little bit of worry that something has happened. Finally at seven, a hotel employee walks up and asks, are you Mr. and Mrs. Blank? They nodded their head and the employee said, your friend is here. But that's impossible. You say, we agreed to meet in the lobby and I've been here for an hour kind of expressing a mixture of relief and frustration. The employee smiled and said, respectfully, this is a very large hotel and we have more than one lobby. 
There are, in fact, two. Your friend is here, but in the other lobby. They had been waiting for someone who was already there. They were looking for someone who had already arrived, was already there. Just like the glasses, looking for something that something that somebody already had. In the Christian tradition, our celebration of the incarnation of Christ, that is Christ taking flesh in our world, happens at Christmas. And that celebration is preceded by these four weeks of watching and waiting and hoping and praying that we call Advent. The Isaiah passage is about the joy of expectation and tells us to watch, to look. But like our glasses, we're looking for something we already have in some way. The one who saves us is already in our midst through his word, his sacraments, this community of faith, and his spirit breathing life in us. It can be a bit confusing to the outside world, those watching our faith in Advent, that we're kind of waiting and watching like that in the hotel lobby, waiting for someone who's already there. We're waiting for Christ who is present here and now by the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're asking for eyes to see the Lord everywhere where we haven't seen him before. We celebrate that he came at Christmas, born of Mary, discovered by shepherds, greeted by magi. Christ has already come. This is the Christmas truth. And we know that he's coming again in glory. This is an Advent truth. The scriptures assure us that he is coming again to settle accounts and to reveal the truth. And Christ is present in your life and mine right now, each day. This is a Holy Spirit truth. The one coming is already here. So perhaps we should ask ourselves this kind of Adventish question. Am I in the right lobby? In other words, am I paying attention to where the Lord is here and now? We might be surprised that the one who feels far off at times is actually as close as the glasses on our head. The people of ancient Israel were looking for God, hoping that God would come soon to heal them and to bring them home. The shepherd who gathers us in his arms and carries us home is here. The people were already in his arms. And so are we. Yes, the people of Israel had lost much. Yes, their world was confusing and strange. God felt far away. But God, the God who saves, hadn't gone anywhere. The people had wandered away from God, but the Lord was with them, even in their suffering, even in the midst of the exile. God was already with them. Isaiah re reveals that the Lord is already at work and is making possible for the people to enjoy the joy of homecoming. They were looking for a Lord who is already there. Their comforting God was as close as the top of their heads. Many people in our world wonder, where is God? And when is God going to come and straighten this mess out? While we wait, we strive to serve the Lord by serving our neighbors. But Isaiah's Advent promise calls us not to live in the past when God came to us in Bethlehem, nor to live in the future when God will come again. Isaiah's promise of comfort is a proclamation of God's presence right here today. Here is your God, Isaiah says. Right here, right now. Put your hands on the top of your head. That's how close God is. And that's what brings us comfort. Comfort and joy. Mm -hmm. We lose our joy whenever we lose sight of our pilgrim status. When we forget that we are moving through God's story. Moving through God's story toward from creation to a new creation. That we're journeying towards a new heaven and a new earth and a forever jubilee. 
let's be reminded that we are pilgrims on a journey, traveling the way Jesus made for us. And so let's have joy in that journey, our journey. In the meantime, as God's people dearly loved, let us work together to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to comfort all who mourn. Our work is to bring good news, God's good news, to the poor, to keep up binding up the brokenhearted and proclaiming release for the captives, liberation for the prisoners, to keep spreading the joy that Jesus has brought into our lives. This is, after all, the true gift that we celebrate, an incarnate life that came to bring all life. And to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.